for sure. Thank you for having me, of course, and thank you for the work that you do. I still have your Mandy in my fridge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's very useful on Eid and I'm looking forward to the candles actually um, I'm Amazing. looking at these candlesticks right now in my studio and I'm like they'd be perfect in those um, but um, yeah uh, my journey my background okay so I you know I grew up in Pakistan I was born in Damascus I was born in Syria but I, I when I was about three three and a half we moved back to Pakistan and um uh, Lebanese on my mother's side, so also have connections there. But yeah, I mean, I'm a through and through Pakistani Sindhi boy. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I, I was very much raised here. And uh, when I was about 18, um, I left the country to pursue higher education. Um, and I've sort of been around a few places, went to Scotland for a bit. And I also uh, went to the US to San Francisco for my uh, postgrad, my MFA. And I did an MFA in fine arts and my undergraduate was in history of arts. So, you know, I, 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 had, the, I had the theoretical background before I had the applied degree, I guess. And yeah. history of art was my roundabout way of getting to fine art, honestly. I actually went into university to do geography i was much more passionate wow. about the environment yes i know i was very passionate about the environment i still am in fact that's is this the, the sin coming in, in is this a sindhi boy the, sin, the indus the river the dolphins i mean this is a pipeline project currently um very much pipeline like the pipe was has just is being you know tightened into the yeah. in its space so it's 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 i don't want to talk too much about it yet but um yeah so that was my first love you know the 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 River Indus, Pakistan, Sindh, water rights, um, biodiversity, and, and, and its relationship to, to the social condition and the social fabric and the historical fabric of the country. Um, and that was kind of the underpinning thing, right? Like social and historical. And that's also what inspired my art practice um, and what inspired my, my delving into art and arts, arts uh, ability to do things. You know, I. I think I, I have a bit of a, maybe a, a ooh, maybe a, it's not pessimistic, perhaps realistic, depending on how you're looking at it. But I, I don't necessarily put faith in art as the change maker of the world. Um, I think art uh, is, uh, is, is beautiful. I think it's inspiring. It inspires the change makers. We are providing a service to the change makers, right? It we inspires the dialogue, like the, the, the initiation of conversation quite a lot of the time. Yes, exactly. But we are not, you know, I mean, of course, you can be both. Um, but I think in, in most cases, artists are, in fact, not the actual people on the ground. And, and I say this as someone who has seen political activism, right? Like it's, it's a little bit more thankless. It's a little bit it's yeah. less glori glorious. It's less glorifying. Um, it, it's, it's a lot dirtier. Um, and it's um, it's a lot more stressful, so and 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 dangerous. Whereas I think being an artist, you're making you're making beautiful things for people to see, and and you want your audience, and you want you know it, it has a different a different desire to it, right? It has a different sort of framework to it. But um, so yeah, so for me, the potential of art was to, like you said, inspire dialogue and inspire conversation. And for me, it was more about what is the legitimacy of history? History is, you know, what it, like, what is even history, right? It's, it's a story. It's a story that we as a nation tell ourselves. With to, our own biases and... With our own biases. It, it validates us. History serves to validate the state narrative or, or the, the narrative of the winner or the narrative even of the oppressed, right? And, and, and um, um, not to say that that's a bad thing to, to validate the narrative of the oppressed, of course, but, uh, but history is a story that we tell ourselves, basically. Um, so for me, that's what kind of captivated my imagination and, and sort of looking at, looking at history. And that's kind of what propel, has propelled um, my current investigation. But yeah, so that's, that's all to say that, you know, going to Edinburgh University, studying history of art and studying fine arts. Uh, then I live in the US for a few years, yeah. um, established my practice there. 
and I've recently moved back to Pakistan. So no. I've been for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Question that I had, one, I want to kind of delve a little bit deeper around Sindh because I am completely oblivious and I don't know anything. So I want to get your perspective because I think that would be brilliant. Mm-hmm. Second, um, in terms of not architecture, but art, looking at the social fabric, looking at how it has the ability to create dialogue, how can outdoor or performative art have an impact on society? I mean, like you said, right? Like we're, you're not a political activist, you're not on the ground and it sometimes is glorified, but it still, I think is just as important to raise awareness and to bring these conversations front and center, right? Yeah. So yeah. how do you see, or do you see this as a theme that has played out in Sin? Do you see this as a theme that's played out in Karachi? I mean, this, this is coming to my mind because like, I, like if you go around the world, like there's different fairs that are outdoor. I mean, I think MoMA has its own like outdoor garden. Um, there's right. Nuit Blanche that happens in uh, Canada and I think France as well. Um, there is cool. another, yeah. sorry? I said freeze is outdoors usually. Freeze is well. outdoors, exactly. Um, the other, the one in uh, Miami, I think. Which one is that? Yeah, yeah. Art Basel. That's all, Art Basel, there we go. That's also, that also has an outdoor component. Um, so I just yeah, want to yeah. kind of get those two perspectives, one on a little bit about sin and one on how art has the ability to kind of create dialogues outside. Yeah, I mean, so... So, you know, I speak as very much as Cindy who, who is, you know, urbanized and has privilege, of course, within, within uh, their own context, within his own context. So, you know, I just want to say that I'm speaking from this vantage point. Um, and, uh, but in the, same, uh, in the same sense, for me, my biggest inspiration, you know, behind my textile works especially has been Sindhi craft and textile has been Sindhi embroidery and textile work and Rally in particular. And I do all of my work my, myself. I have no cardigans. I don't, I don't outsource anything. I mean, from design to the end to the last stitch is all me. Um, and for me, I think this, this, it, it becomes, you know, I've been, you know, since I've moved back, people have been like, oh, you should encourage, I don't know, you should help Sindhi women in villages by giving them your work and making them do it instead and paying them something. And for me, that, that, uh, that, that's not actually changing anything. That's just paying someone to do something. And I think we have a lot of that. And this is all going back to the fact that I think for me, um, uh, 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 Pakistan has a real problem with craft. Mm-hmm. We don't respect craft. Artists 100%. don't respect craft right so people don't see why I do my sequining or my embroidery myself like why would you do that you know there's other people that can do that well it's like well then why would you paint your own painting there's other people that can do that I'm sure far better so so you know like so why not outsource that too so I think I think I think that goes back to the fact that I think uh, 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 Sindh for me you know the 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 art the the arts of Sindh the arts of this country reflect um uh, uh, reflect an embodied, um, uh, 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 it, it's history embodied, right? It's culture embodied that's rendered visible and rendered plastic and rendered tangible and holdable. Yet at the same time, it's relegated to, you know, stuff that you put on your blanket or stuff that you sleep with or whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever. So for me, you know, I, 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 I think that in an, you know, the, popular crafts and popular arts from textile making to poster making, these are all very, very valid forms of art and they're devotional. Um, And I think that that's also what Sindh has. It's a very devotional place, which has allowed it to be as diverse as it has been for the past however many millennia, is that it doesn't matter who you love necessarily as far as the name of your God or the name of your saint or the name of the person next to you. It's the devotion that counts. It's the That's weight beautiful. of the devotion that counts. I, yeah, I have and not I, looked at it in that regard, but I think that it's a very heavy word, devotion, and the way that you're um, explaining it is, is beautiful. Well, and, and I think, but I think that's precisely it. You know, our dargahs are, are places of 
I've worshipped, you know, Odero Lal, where there's a mandir and a masjid that surrounds one darga. And yes, of course, it's not perfect. You know, at times in history, these places have been tense. Um, uh, but, but what, again, what has always counted is the fact that people go there with love in their hearts and with a yeah. great sense of devotion. You know, Palander Shebaz, for example, you go there and there are people from all, all faiths uh, um, who go there, you know, and all genders who go there, right? And again, once you're in that space, it doesn't matter who you are or why you're there. It matters that you're there and you're giving yourself, right? And I think that's, you know, with embroidery, Cindy embroidery and Cindy textiles, you know, for the most part, these are home things, right? It's, it's women and children who make them for the home. Yeah. Um, and then the selling comes later, right? The selling is is uh is 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 a hopeful thing right the extra stuff that you the can excess. sell on the highway the excess you know for example if you're traveling on the highway as soon as you enter sind from punjab you see rallies on sale you know you you enter the the um the you know the border at Budu and you see uh, all of these all of these um uh rallies for sale so i think devotional practice is a huge is a huge part of of who we are um, as a people. And that has allowed us to embrace many, many, many different people. Uh, and I hope that that keeps going. Unfortunately, I think in, a, in, a, in our world today, sometimes uh, one can feel a little bit more pessimistic than optimistic, but, um, but it still exists. And um, going back to your conversation as far as how that relates to art, could you could you could you ask me that part again? I went into a whole other zone, and I think I need to. No, no. I, I mean, it's 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 amazing what you were saying because it's 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 absolutely fascinating. I've always been fascinated with the idea of the art and the idea of devotion. I think it's it's amazing. What I was asking, or what I'd love to kind of get from there, are outdoor or in spaces. You know, looking at the geography, looking at the architecture, and looking at art as me art as mediums. How can there be discourse in public spaces? And have you seen that happen? Like, I mean, the reason that I'm asking this is also because like recently, I think yesterday or day before there was this project called An Arkley Live. I don't know if you're familiar with it. There's a couple of artists that are doing some like uh, works all around An um, and they had their opening, I think it was yesterday. But I've, I've always found that idea fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. Like how do you bring the practice of creating or wanting to start a conversation into public sphere? That's a very good question that I think a lot of, in particular, Sindhi artists ask themselves because the further away you go from Karachi, the less there is as far as artistic opportunity. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, also, you know, the further you go away from Lahore, or Pindi or Islamabad, I mean, it's kind of, I, I feel like it's kind of the same. But Sindh is is still a very rural place. You know, it it it, it relies so much on 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 agriculture and these yeah. smaller rural cities. Um, and I think, how do we how do we talk about the public sphere? I mean, it's it's a slow process in in, in a country like this, right? And and I think it it has to be. Um, dealt with not by people from the from the outside coming in with a sort of grand agenda of like this is how we're going to do public art, but it has to come from the very places that that need it or desire it or want it or are asking for it. You know, so I think a good example now in Sin, for example, is the rise of a very you have an educated Sindhi middle class outside of Karachi, you know, okay. that, you know, in cities like Hyderabad, Larkana, Sakhar, Jamshoro, um, um, you know, in these particular places, you have a young, educated lot of Sindhis who are from Muslim and Hindu backgrounds and Christian backgrounds who are now raising their voices and challenging this idea of urban and rural sin. For example, a lot of Karachiites don't think of themselves as being from sin. They don't want to think of themselves as being from sin because sin is poor, <laughs> sin is rural, sin is backwards. You know, there's all these negative connotations. And I remember I was called out also online for saying uh, interior sin. And someone said, there is no such thing as interior sin. There's Karachi and there's other cities in sin, right? <laughs> There is no such thing as interior sin. 
Um, and there's also Hindu activists now who are raising their voices, who are saying, why do I have to write on a form if I'm Muslim or non-Muslim? I'm not non-Muslim, I'm Hindu. Yeah. You know, and there's, so there's this act, and there's a lot of young people, uh, uh, in particular in the Hindu community now, who are being very vocal uh, and, and very self-aware. Now, will art in the public sphere follow this? Yes, it will. Um, but for example, someone like me can't dictate how that goes. Um, I can try my best to establish something, which, which I'd like to get another pipeline project is hopefully to establish something in Northern Sindh, right? And what we do know, you and I, as far as people who have been in the art world, we know what, it, what the general expectations are of an internationalized, globalized art world, right? We know that people in residencies or professional, for professional opportunities or to get your work out there, they want to see a well-written bio and they want to see a well-written artist statement and they want to see a cohesive project and they want to know you've been working on that project and giving that project your blood and sweat for the past few years. Um, and then you exhibit it and you sell it all and then you're done. Um, and whatever, you know, we know what those expect expectations are. And so, yes, we can, we can always bring that knowledge with us, uh, but that's not necessary to say that that's what's needed, for example, in, in these places. So as far as art in the public sphere, you know, I mean, in, in Karachi, there's of course a lot happening. Like we saw how the Biennale in Karachi compared to the Biennale in Lahore, and I'm, I'm not at all trying to be rude about anything at all, but the Karachi Biennale spread out throughout the city. There were no collateral events. The Lahore Biennale was like, we're in the fort or we're in the old city, for example, the second one, and anything that's not in these two places, these two beautiful places that have recently been you know, done up, uh, everything outside of that is collateral. Yani K, it's happening at the same time, but it's not part of the Biennale. But the Karachi Biennale said everything that's happening all over the entire city from the Southern District of Clifton to, you know, KDA and Southern and Garden uh, area and Liari, you know, these are all part of the Biennale. So we have already, I think Karachiites have a sense of, of, of art that needs to be in the public sphere. And I think there is a growing awareness about what art is. For example, when the Biennale happens, lots of people actually go to it. And lots of people are aware of it here. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's as far as public art has gone here, as far as a mass thing. I think performativity, we're still struggling with that, right? Like the body, we still feel a little uncomfortable with the body exposed in space. Because the body exposed in space, um, even in the US, not just in the Pakistani context, right? It, it brings up matters of class, of of, of, uh, of, and then related to that faith, religion, um, you know, fahashi, I guess you'd say in Pakistan, you know, people from good families mm. versus people not, right? It brings up all these questions uh, and these tensions that, that, that the artist in space has to navigate, right? Yeah. Um, that's not to say there isn't great performance work happening in Pakistan, but we are still uh, a little uneasy in how to navigate these various cross sections that would come up with the body in public space. And that even, and like I said, it happens in the US as well. A black artist from a lower income background doing a performance uh, about their experience in public space is very different to an artist who comes from an upper middle class or a wealthier family um, doing a performance in public space about something a lot more abstract, right? And because there is that tension of class and race and place, and do you even have a right to be here doing this? Um, so, so this is something I think we're still navigating um, as, as, as a community here. But there is amazing performance work that happens in private in Pakistan from people of all social classes and backgrounds. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, Amin Gulji is a really good example of someone who's trying to push the limits even of this conversation of class and boundaries and whatever, right? I mean, it's not to say we shouldn't push these ideas, but you know, Amin Gulji is a really good example. And there's a lot of young people as well who are in the music world and who also are experimenting with drag and are experimenting with dance and are experimenting with all these forms that are both local and foreign, you know? And, and, and there's a really interesting synergy that's happening in this country. Um, you know, like while you were answering the question, there was something that you said that, that really resonated with me where, you know, we have a picture of what an art world or what a residency or a gallery or a fair looks like. 
but that's not necessarily exactly what we need here. So it's not mm-hmm. like it. I think it's a very important kind of discer like uh, like the discerning thing that we do need to always take a look at that. Not necessarily the conversations Baha Europe mein ho rahi hai, America mein ho rahi hai, are applicable here. And yeah. also the fact that this is still a very nascent country and all of these things that need to evolve for us to get to a place of that ability, ke, like, you know, we are able to understand or create those kinds of dialogues in these kinds of places or whatever. So I think that is very important because I, I look at it also from like a, a tech lens and like how you can kind of, you know, look at something that's working in another country and try to apply it here, but it won't necessarily work because the intricacies of how society works, of how geography works in this country is very different from the West or from in any other yeah. country. So those yeah. things are, are very important. And I really like that you mentioned that. Um, man, one of the things that I've been always fascinated about and I always wanted to learn more about is you shared this on Dastangi as well and you shared this with me initially, was the Mandir project, like archiving and going on this road trip and seeing all of these beautiful mandirs that exist. And mm-hmm. it kind of comes back to this art of devotion and, and that kind of conversation. But I, I really want to know where that, that project started from, where it's going. Uh, are you still archiving as you're going along? Because the other issue that I have is like, there aren't that many archives. And it's like, it's first mm-hmm. for the Asanga, it's like, it's so difficult sometimes to be able to find these narratives and find these stories. Like, I feel like we're very much storytellers with people. Like we need to sit down with our parents or our grandparents and they're the best storytellers. But yeah. we don't have much written um, or documented for the younger generation or for someone to be able to go. And I might be completely wrong and I just haven't been able to get, those, get to those archives, but I'd love to get your perspective on, on that project of yours. Um, and yeah. I think. Uh, how did it, okay, well, let's go to how did it start. I mean, archiving is a big thing. Like I said before, history or historical knowledge or our assumed knowledge of history uh, is, is, a, is a big part of my practice. And the only thing, um, the only thing in which we can correct assumptions that may be wrong is through do- like actual documentation, right? Actual archive. You know, you want to accuse someone of something historically, well, maybe there's a video or a sound bite of them that con- contradicts that, for example, or a photograph that contradicts that or validates it, right? So, you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, and of course, as we move now, you know, we have other forms of documentation that keep coming up of our, of our modern world. But that's all to say that when I, you know, I, when I moved out of Pakistan, it was out of, it was, it was, you know, both for higher education and also because the situation was becoming a little bit more volatile and so my family was like okay maybe for the time being just go abroad and you already need to do school anyway so that created a sort of fear in me that maybe one day I won't be able to come back so whenever I did come back I would travel so I traveled all over since I did the road trip from from you know to Lahore and to Islamabad also a couple a few times actually uh, I've been to Tharparkar several times I've been to Balochistan And for me, what felt really important to document was that, of course, within the Pakistani state narrative, Muslims are, Islam is why we exist, right? Uh, And of course, as someone who is a Muslim, like, of course, I I, I believe in Islam. I'm I'm, I'm someone who believes in that kind of devotion as well to my faith. Uh, But we are a very diverse country. Um, And Sindh in particular, you know, was a place that was Hindu, and Muslim, and, and, and it was that interesting synergy where Hindus would practice Persianate culture or Arabized culture, for example, because Sindh had this influx of Iranian and, and Persian and Arab influences constantly coming in. So Sindhi script, which is, an, which is an Arabic script, and it's even written in Nasr calligraphy, not Nastali, like Urdu is, which is much more Persian. Uh, Sindhi is written in what is commonly, what Arabic is commonly written in, you know, and it resembles Arabic actually a lot more. So when my mother actually moved from Lebanon to Sindh, when people would give her things to read in Urdu, she found that much more difficult than things that were given to her to her to read in Sindhi. She could read oh, Sindhi wow. much better yeah. than she could read Urdu, right? So um, so even, even Sindhi Hindus, I went to a mandir in London and I saw Arabic scripts writing the names of Krishna and Julilal and Kalima and Shiva. You know, so this this for me is is very, very special. Um, And we can't lose this. 
you know, we can't lose this and we can't lose our memory of it either. You know, because who knows what this, which direction this country is going in. I hope only the best, but you never know. And, um, and so for me, it felt very important to document both the mandirs and masjids that you found on the highway in, in rural Sindh, you know, going all the way from, you know, Lar to Uttar, you know, south to northern Sindh, and then to Thar Parker as well. And it's interesting, people in Thar have a very distinct identity. You know, they, they're like, oh, we're Sindhi, but we're not Sindhi. We're not Biraji. You know, Biraji meaning where the barrages are, the irrigated areas of Sindh. We're not Biraji, we're Thardi or we're Parkari. And they even, they, the language is even different. It's much more similar to Gujarati. Um, and uh, uh, so, um, so this, so this for me was was very important to document, and it was out of a need for archive to document what what to us was this very complex idea of indigeneity, right? And in South Asia, indigeneity is a very very complex thing. It's not like in the U.S., no, um, where there's a distinct split between those who were and those who came, you know. Yeah. So, um, so. So this did feel important. And then I got an opportunity. Uh, there was this publication that came up called the Subjective Atlas of Pakistan. I don't know if you know about it, but they asked me um, to do more on the series. So it's been published, um, but I'd like to do more with it. Right now, it's kind of asleep um, because I've been working on a few other things. I've been finishing up my project tomorrow in Heart the Earth um, and also doing then there's a couple other pipeline stuff. So for now it's kind of slept, but I'd like to make it into a book or sort of create a page for it on my website that's specifically devoted to this archive and hopefully build on it. Cause you know, I still go to Larkana very frequently. And you know, at this point when you go so often you just want to get there. Uh, so I haven't, I don't stop as, as quickly as much as I used to, to be like, oh, this random tiny looking shrine stop <laughs> so every and and because if i did that we'd stop every 10 minutes yeah. so so you know um but yeah for me it was like you said it was important to, that people know that this is what this is pakistan also you know this is where we're from um and even in people in karachi don't imagine that this is what pakistan is you know um so let alone punjab or, or lahore yeah. or Islamabad. so um yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, I, I, I loved it because it showcases a different Pakistan, right? Like it showcases all of the intricacies. And also, like, I, I completely agree, like, 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 we are always too focused on the destination that we forget kind of taking our surroundings. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm realizing more and more is, is the fact that you cannot, like, I've been doing road trips myself um, with mm. Walia. Mm. And the more like the more wrong turns or the little like off peaks you do the more serendipitous crazy beautiful historical things that you notice um Very and true. we would not otherwise right like yeah. and you'll go to your destination but you'll forget like you know like what's that Eckhart Tolle like the power of now and like being able to like be and like accept and, and and kind of admire and enjoy the moment and you can only do that when you're able to kind of like take a back seat and be able to kind of enjoy the little things that kind of come on your way rather than just always kind yeah. of trying to rush through life i think it's very important um for us to be able to do that and the motorways question. huh gg Sorry, the on. development of the motorways are stopping that luxurious yeah. road trip yeah. that i you mean used to. imagine going to gt road right like just a historical reference yeah. and like being able to go across so many different countries and seeing so much in between um yeah, 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 yeah. it's just, it just where gt road in kabul or in kandahar where does i think GT it go? goes to kabul it starts i mean uh, i have it right next to my house but i think it goes from kabul to bangladesh if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, like Kabul to Dhaka or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, and, oh, what was your question, Gigi? So, okay, so the question that I had was, what are some of the themes that are of most interest to you these days? Um, big question, big question. You know, since moving back, uh, I can't deny that my focus is shifting you know and i have 
I have an interest, I'm having these moments of sort of loyalty to finishing the work that I want to finish. And then also, you know, when you're an artist, you're an artist because there's ideas and themes that haunt you. You know, you, you obsess over things. And sometimes you obsess over two things, like either the, the one thing has to be complete and made and rendered perfect. And then the other thing needs to be explored <laughs> and gathered and fished for, for inspiration and data and, and whatnot. So right now, I'm actually finishing one project. I'm, uh, I've been working for the past five years on this body of work called Tomorrow We Inherit the Earth, which includes mm -hmm. textile pieces, um, mostly textile pieces that are meant to illustrate a sort of, I used to say future. It was a futurist series. It is a futurist series. It's a queer Muslim futurist series was the term that I came up with. Um, and I like wrote all these papers about queer Muslim futurism, but it's funny, I'm a little less obsessed with this idea of futurism now and okay. more a different, a parallel potential world, right? A revolution, it's meant, to, it's meant to be a fake archive of a revolution that may have been or could have been, okay. or that perhaps was, or maybe will be. So these textile pieces that I make are, you know, they're, 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 they're photo inspired. Uh, you've probably seen images uh, of wrestlers and sort of glorified, mostly, mostly actually men, but like highly embroidered and highly sort of embezzled with sequin and all this different work. And they're meant to sort of represent these eulogizing portraits like you find in Shia um, Ashura processions uh, of shaheeds and of martyrs, but instead they're of a different world, right? And they have, they're a bit anthropomorphic, some have bull heads, some have gas masks, but all very much inspired from this idea of, of Ashura processions. So a lot of the textile work has been done and has been made. So, and, but be, and, I, and alongside that, I used to do performances that would accompany them. But now I'm finishing up this body of work with a four part film series called Abjad. Nice. Um, and uh, the first two films are being released in San Francisco on September 10th and yes. September 15th. So um, that's very exciting. So it's, that's, you know, it's kind of like five years of work consolidated into four films, into a narrative. The idea is that this project, the series of a revolution, the story of a revolution, that's that's been shown through these tapestries and these textiles can be narrated through film, right? Um, mm. I I love the convergence of like the different mediums. Mm, like, mm, mm. The, the like I, I mean I've always been very fascinated by storytelling and fascinated by forms of storytelling, and I love that you're converging film with performance with textile, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And each has its own intricacies and its own kind of narratives and kind of combining them all together I, is, is beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And I think they're all meant to be together. I mean, for me, my, my practice is more concerned with, with story, right? With a story. And in, in this particular project, it's world building, right? You're creating another world for someone to be in, right? And, and, and the textile pieces are usually quite big kind of for that purpose, right? That you feel engulfed um, in, this, in this kind of worldview. But the films, I think, help, to, help to, narrate, to narrate the story a little bit more. And I'm very into narrative as well. And also as a performance artist, you know, I come into, the, into films as a performance artist. So even though I'm directing these, technically the films are performances um, that have a series of each film has different collaborators also. Um, as well, um, and and there's a huge team actually involved, like this cinematographer Jim Shadirani and set lighting designer Humayun Mehman, and we've had different sound people uh, collaborating with folks in San Francisco. This person called Peekaboo, who's a great cellist, and then folks here in Pakistan um, as well, who I've been working with. So it's been a it's been a huge feat, and this project was initially meant to be done in the U.S. Uh, but one thing led to another and I decided to move back. So because of COVID, of course, I'm, I'm able to sort of work on them here as long as I premiere them in the US. But of yeah. course they will find their way to Pakistan um, eventually. So I'm looking forward to, to that actually, to that part of it when they can come 
come home. Um, so that's kind of what's taking up my brain space now. Like at this very moment, that's what my brain is. That's what's full in my brain.